Okay, good morning. Uh, morning. You are in collaborating on content audits. And uh, I'm Dora Kellner. I'm from Sledpan Studios. We are a digital agency in Fairfax, Virginia. So thank you for having me at your camp. I appreciate that. Um, I run discovery and content uh, strategy sessions for our clients. I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher. So I have learned over the years of working in IT, which has been many, um, that um, we need to have some perspective and we need to have some understanding of each other um, and the stress that some of these processes cause us in our industry. So hopefully today I will help you to come up with a framework for conducting content strategies and at the same time, um, give a new perspective to the role of the content strategist and the importance of content in building your websites. So everyone has a drawer that looks like this, or maybe even a room that looks like this. And I've seen people's houses that look like this. And you're looking for something and you have no idea other than it's somewhere in this drawer. I'll find it. And you rummage around the drawer for a while and you get really frustrated because you cannot find it. So you're like, okay, I'm going to go out and buy another one. And you buy it and this is the drawer that it's supposed to live in. So you put it back in the drawer. A couple weeks later, you're like, I know I just bought that. And you go back to the drawer and you can't find it again. This is called hoarding. And you need to look at your websites from that same perspective. Are we hoarding our content? Do we have so much content that has evolved over so much time in an architecture that we had never intended that it turns into this drawer? Because the next time you go to this drawer and you can't find it, you're never going to look for it again. And that's exactly what happens on websites. Somebody finds you. They know that the information should exist on your site. They go to your site. They can't find it. They rummage around a while. They give up. And they give up pretty fast, probably faster than you gave up looking for whatever it was in this drawer. So when they give up, you have just lost a visitor, and you've lost a visitor for life. So it's not just about doing a content audit to rearrange the content you've got. It's about doing a content audit to purge, to get rid of what's needed, to identify what's missing, and to fix this drawer. So this is pretty much the life of a content strategist. I'm going to read this to you. You lie awake at night thinking about your content. There is so much to fix, so much to plan for. You want to get ahead, but you can barely keep up with what's happening day to day. The last time you tried talking to somebody about the big picture, the conversation was cut short by yet another content emergency that put you right back into reactive mode and the content keeps coming and coming and coming. Uh, Christina Halverson wrote this in Content Strategy for the Web. I highly recommend if you have not digested this book cover to cover that you do. Um, we want to move away from being reactive to responsive, from being reactive to proactive, and always be visible and relevant in the entire web development process. So we have this content creation process that most of us do some uh, similar aspect of this. And we start by saying, who's our audience? Who's our customer? Uh, we are, why are we even doing this? You know, what are the business goals behind it? Um, how is the content going to be distributed? What channels are we using? So is it only the web? Are we so on social media? Do we have other devices for distributing our content? Um, and then 
what are we going to create and when are we going to create it and how is it going to get promoted? And that kind of goes in a loop with looking at content performance and prioritizing the content. And we need to give our users better content because in this process, this should all be about the user. But all too often, it's about the client. What do they want? What department is screaming the loudest? Who the CEO is who wants stuff? Who wants their stuff on the home page? So we need to follow a process that brings this back to the original point, which is if you don't have the content that your visitor is looking for, the website really shouldn't exist in the first place. Okay. So what does a content audit do for you? It's going to actually support fact-based decision making. When you have evidence that content is performing or not performing, you have something to give to those higher ups who might be saying, but, but, but we want this. But you can show them exactly what data is available and put yourself on a more neutral territory with them. So it's not about fighting them and saying, that's not really how it works. It's about presenting data to them so that they can understand exactly what's going on. So they can better meet their needs, improve for their audience, and all the other things that a website is actually supposed to do for their visitors. Um, the audit is the key for making this all work. This is going to give you the data that you need to present. And secondarily, but I think more importantly, it's going to give respect to, the, um, to content strategy as a profession. So that we're not just there saying, oh, we have to write content. Seems like an afterthought, right? Everybody's like, oh, well, we'll build the site and we'll worry about the content later. No, we're building the site around the content. So let's give ourselves some credibility and respect for the content strategy role. And the content audit, I believe, allows us to do that in, a, in an evidence-based way. So when are we going to audit? You're, you audit, obviously, during a redesign, or if you're changing from one CMS to another, that one's obvious. You're migrating. We're all going to be doing a lot of migration over the next couple of years. Um, but I think right now, on a rolling basis, it's really valuable to not keep your site static, to continuously look at what's out there and come up with a strategy for doing audits on a rolling basis. So when you've got that box of junk that you move or that junk drawer, you never go back to it. You never look at it again. So that's the same sort of thing that you're doing on your website. You don't miss it, so let's get rid of it. Let's purge what we don't need. Let's not use the website as an archive. I had a client, literally, who every time they had an event, they went back to the event page, and they started typing in all of the speakers on the event on that event page, and, you are, and links to PDFs for their presentations. They never told us, well actually we inherited the site so we didn't know, that they really needed a mechanism for uh, creating an event content type that would hold a structure. So they just started typing all this stuff in. They are my smallest client and they take up the most space on my server because they just have, they just decided this is a place we're gonna archive everything. So these are the people that we need to get to. We don't want the content to be non-performant. You know, we want quality, we want findability, and we want to build a business case for doing this and give, let the audit be our big win on the content strategy space. So most people think, well, we're going to start with a spreadsheet, put all the content in the spreadsheet, take a look at it. And yes, we are going to do that, but first we're going to do a discovery. We should be involved in the discovery phase of every project. We want to understand 
what that audience really looks like. What is the brand we're, we're talking about? What is the tone, the message, the objectives? Where is the content going to come from? Who's going to maintain it? What channels do we have to be concerned about? Because a content strategist probably isn't just going to be dealing with the website. They probably are also looking at the bigger picture, newsletters, videos, social media, any other way that content needs to be created. So we're going to start with the discovery, just understand how the audience is interacting with us, how we want them to interact with us, which might be different than how they already are interacting with us, and determine what do we have that we can repurpose versus what do we have that we can purge. And this is where we're going to roll up our sleeves. So sorry, as the content person in charge of auditing, this is going to be your job. So how many people here? Is everybody here in content? Is anybody OK? So <laughs> it, it, do I have designers in here? Do I have actual developers in here? I'd love to see developers, project managers. Awesome. This, this is a really um, important point to make, is that even though the content strategist is going to go heads down for a while, they're going to come back to you. In my process, they're going to come back to you, and you're going to be part of the audit. Um, and it's really, I think, an important aspect to making this successful. But right now, maybe you have 500 pages, maybe you have 5,000 pages. You do need to document all of it. Sorry, you do. If you don't have the bandwidth to do that, if you're really at that million plus website um, number of pages, you do have options. And I've got two really good options for you. Um, one is content sampling. So with content sampling, you are going to look across all your content for patterns. That way you don't have to look at every single page. So you start looking for patterns and see what patterns emerge that will allow you to make some decisions and answer some questions. And so the patterns are, might be objectives or audience or traffic or ownership by department, however it is. But make it representative of the site as a whole. Your other option is to do a rolling audit. So you take different parts of the site at different months or different quarters um, so that you're touching all your content at some point during the year, but you're not overwhelmed by having to do the whole thing at once. And so we've broken out the content audit process into quantitative and qualitative work. So I'm going to start with the quantitative work, and here is where, yes, the spreadsheet does come into play. You want to build a meaningful system. This system might have been meaningful for one project or not another. It might be meaningful for one agency and not another. Um, you're, you're welcome to look at the columns that are here in mine. Um, but you might want to adapt this to whatever really works for your organization and your project. Um, it needs to be meaningful. Um, you need to know the audience and the owners and the content types and the purpose. And how are we going to map the current URLs to the new URLs if we're actually rebuilding the site? Um, so think about all these, these pieces and parts that you might want to put into the inventory. And then you're going to start looking at analytics. So you'll be adding the analytics to your inventory. And obviously, you're going to look at, at low unique page views. That's a given. Um, the, just within specific areas, um, you know, are we changing course? Are we having trouble with what we currently have for people actually coming to the pages we think they should come to? We're going to look at traffic patterns, um, page loads, um, pages that are without owners, pages that haven't been modified in, in many, many years. We're going to try to find some ROI in the data using the analytics. And then we're going to identify what were our KPIs? You know, how does our current content score against what we thought we were measuring? Right? So different audience segments, frequency of update, you know, calls to action. Where are people going? Where are they, how are they getting to the page? Where are they going from the page? You know, what are our measures? And that way we can make some decisions based on our findings. We're obviously going to look at the top performing pages. 
why are they our top performing pages? Now, some of the top performing pages might not be important to our business goals. You know, can we can we give them up? Can we say just because they get a lot of hits, maybe they're not relevant anymore? Or can we say these are great examples of how our content should be written and distributed? Why aren't the other pages doing as well? So can we use these as a measure against which to evaluate the other pages in our site? We can look at pages by department. So these are all just different examples that you can use to try to get your creativity going and how to um, evaluate your content. And, you know, here are different page views by department. Which department's page views are really low? You know, who's, not, who's not performing and why? So perhaps a department doesn't have a content owner anymore. That happens. People don't realize that when somebody leaves, they need to appoint somebody new into that role, and it just goes by the wayside. Um, target audience is a really interesting way to look at your content, percentage by um, how many pages, and then how many views. So you might say here, well, we have 32% of our pages for members, but that's taking up 50% of our views. How do we look at that? Should we have more pages for our members? Or are the pages for the other audiences not performing? And therefore, people are ending up in places looking for information where it wasn't intended for it to be. We can look at revision year. We get really excited when a new site goes up, and we write lots and lots of new content, and then all of a sudden we stop doing it because other things take our time. And we don't make it a priority to keep the content up to date. So go back and look at everything that's more than two years old and say, do we need it? Why didn't we change it? Why aren't we updating it? What value can we add to it? So all of this can really be summarized as looking at the rot. And the ROT stands for redundant, out of date, and trivial. So beyond storage, there is actually a cost to maintaining all this content. You know, like I said, content, the, the website is not an archive, and so your content gets old. And it has a shelf life. And when you just keep putting more and more content into the site, then your usability and your findability starts to plummet. Okay. So we want to get rid of this information so that our users aren't getting overwhelmed by how much content they're finding on our site. Uh, so rot, redundancy. Redundancy is when a member, say it's an association, a member calls you and says, I can't find this piece of information. And you panic and you go, oh, we should add that to this other menu also. And maybe we should also put that on the home page because we're not thinking strategically at that point. Like, maybe our architecture needs some evaluation. We're just trying to solve the problem when it hits our desk so that we can put it away and say, check, we finished that problem. We, told, we, we listened to the member and he said, I want it on this menu and gee, we put it there. Okay. So I had a client that did just this. And when we redesigned their site, you could see that the same elements were across all different aspects of the architecture. The same page, over and over and over again. Because one person thought I should be able to find it here, another person thought I should be able to find it there. To me, that's just a huge red flag. I need to redo the architecture. They don't know where to find the information. Okay. So that's redundancy. Um, so you're going to look at pages that aren't frequently visited. You're going to look at you know, editors putting content in multiple places. That's how we're going to find all that. Out of date content. Old expired products that don't exist anymore. You know, even, I could even say on a lot of sites, old events, like why are we keeping those up there? Yeah, oh yeah, people will want to go back and look, who was that speaker five years ago? Yeah, they don't. They don't. We can get rid of that. Um, we can repurpose, you know, rewrite, and eliminate all of the out-of-date content on the site. Um, make sure all our links are working. Right? 
and and really go. And once we get this process going, we're, we're going to look at your content every year. But when you start it, go back two years. I would recommend. And then there's the trivial. So there's a process called um, core modeling that aligns the business objectives of the website with the user expectations. And we find the places where those overlap, and we call those the core pages of the site. We often have a lot of content that's misaligned to the tasks that our users want to do. So can we get rid of that? Why does it exist? Okay. And what content doesn't meet the standards that we have set for the site? Is it written in such a way that it is not going to address what our audience needs? So if you have been working in the web for 20 years, you know that when we started, everybody wanted a weather widget on their site. Right? It didn't matter what the website was about, we gotta have that weather widget. We wanna see the sun and we wanna see the snowfall. Trivial, right? So think about trivial in terms of that weather widget. Do you ever see it anywhere anymore? It's gone. We all got smarter. They, I'm sure there's still some WordPress sites that have that widget. <laughs> Just floating out in cyberspace somewhere. I, I'm sure they're out there, but I'm assuming most Drupal sites do not have the weather widget. Yes, we have advanced beyond the weather widget. Um, so we're going to look, obviously, at bounce rates and, and page views and, and maybe even employ the core model, which I'm not going to go over today. That's a whole other session that I have. Uh, but it's a, it's a valuable process, and you might want to look into that. And so we're going to act on all this. We're going to fix what's broken. We're going to delete or archive what we don't need. We're going to look at what's missing. Because this whole process is also going to show us what's, what isn't there. What did we expect to find that we did not find? So the quantitative tools that we are going to use for this really don't matter. I don't want this to be a tool-based thing. Use whatever works for you. Use whatever your company will buy for you. It all, it's all good. So whether that's a spreadsheet or you write a view, I've done this many times, I've just gone in and written a view and pulled all that data out and thrown it into the spreadsheet. You can use the tools if you have them available to you. And obviously, if you have, you're, you should look at your analytics. So no one right way to do it. Pick what works for you. Now we're going into the qualitative work. And you can go, oh, well, this is where it gets squishy. So how can we keep it from getting squishy? How do we keep it objective? And Christina, again, has a wonderful method in the book for determining how to um, make this into data. So it might be qualitative, usability, findability. All of this is kind of a qualitative thing. But once you put a scale on these, you can put it on the spreadsheet. So maybe you do a one to five scale. Usability, how structured is the content? Knowledge level, what's the complexity of it? Does it match our audience? One to five. Findability, is it coming up in searches? Okay. Actionability, do we have good calls to action clarity? Do we know that it's going to take people to where we want it to go? Um, is it aligned with your primary and secondary audiences? And is it accurate? Measuring accuracy, measuring quality, re measuring reputation scores. These are things you can put on a one to five scale and add to, the, add to the spreadsheet. It is qualitative, but you've just turned it into data. Okay. And the reason we're doing all of this is that now we're going to bring everyone into the room. So everything I've said to now was for the content strategist, heads down, working on the audit. Maybe it's one person. Maybe you have a small team doing it. But now it's time to share all this information and put all of this in context and get the buy-in. So we have data. How many people expect a content strategist to walk into a room with data, right? New concept, they don't expect that of us. 
they, they really don't. They expect to see a spreadsheet, but do they expect to see all the analysis that goes behind it? Do they expect to see all the scoring that we've done with it? Okay. So here's where we want everyone to be part of the process because everyone has an opportunity to fill in the gaps. Project manager talking about scope, designers talking about layout, developers talking about how can we get that done within the budget. Coming away with a consensus on the findings, not necessarily a consensus on where we're gonna go from there, but a consensus on the baseline. This is where we're starting from. Okay? We don't need to go any further right now. This is where we're, we're all in agreement. This is where we're starting from. Okay? If people don't want to consume the site, it doesn't matter that we have one. So that's the argument that we're coming into the room with. And this is who we want in the room. If I've missed a role, come up later and tell me because I keep adding roles to this, to each of the seats at the table. And we want all the players to sit and we lead the discussion. The content strategist is leading this meeting. The designers and the developers need to know the constraints and provide the opportunity for us to publish the content we want to publish. They're partners. Okay. Everything that is being developed for the site needs to be developed with real content, not with Laura Mipsum. Mm -hmm. right? So I've had this one site where we left a certain amount of room for titles and it turned out that, gee, the government wanted to use five-line titles in all of their content. Ooh, design did not look good after that. That's an SEO name. Yes. And you try to explain that to, um, uh, to a government senior exec, and that's, that's a tough, tough sell. No, our, our requirements are that these specific words are in the titles. If that's the case, I want real content. I really want to know what I'm dealing with. Like you said, I want to know that I can tell them that's going to be a problem. We can do it, but here are the issues it's going to cause. We can do it, here's what it's going to look like. Is that really what you want? So do this with real content. So we don't want the development team going off and creating the content types and all this in a vacuum. Show them what, show, give people a, a fighting chance. Designers and developers need to see what your content looks like before they go off and create. So the, they're part of, you're all part of the same team. You're all building the same product. Okay? Next, who's going to be responsible for all of this content? The publishing world, there's a process. Somebody owns the content. They talk about governance. They bring to light in the content strategy space the audience, the process, the politics that go behind the content. So who's going to own all of this? You know, who's going to understand all the audiences and all the relationships and all the people who have to have buy-in into this on top of that all, all the politics? Okay. So we need a governance plan. And we need to have this life cycle owned by somebody. Now, this might be your life cycle. I think it's pretty complete. Um, you might have additional steps you want to put in. You might have something you want to take out, whatever works for your organization. But what this life cycle is going to do is ensure that you're not creating more rot. If we follow our life cycle, then we don't have to do another content redesign. Maybe in the future we say, oh, we want to redesign the look and feel of the site. We want to add new functionality. But the content should be start to be taking care of itself through the process so that the owners of the content are always on top of it. And we don't have to go through this huge audit experience again. We can just every few months have a schedule by which we look through our stuff, clean it up, and move on. Okay. So you make sure you're serving your audience. Make sure that every piece of content has an owner. That is what the governance process is about. Okay. We're going to look at tone 
of the content? You know, is it, if you have jargon in your website, don't pretend that you're funny and light. You're not. If you respond to issues in the public, I have a client that is deals with relation, business relations in China. Well, things come up in the news cycle constantly. They need to have a process where they know they need to respond to that with new content. Okay? So that tone is going to really be aligned with the audience and with the needs of the content and not, oh, everybody's doing light and funny websites, so should we. Okay? Consistency, we need a cadence to our publishing. People want to come back to the site if you've got something more for them to use and look at. So are you publishing on a regular cycle? Are you leveraging your brand? You need a process to control all that. So the tools on the qualitative side are many, and you might have more, but doing calendars, having a migration plan, um, running a content production workshop, which is a really cool opportunity to have people sit down and determine you know, what, who, who's touching the content at what time, and really creating the governance process in the first place um, is a really useful thing to do. And you're really building workflow in the qualitative aspect of doing the audit. Who, the workflow is going to help us understand the, from inception to publishing exactly what's going to happen along the way. And so that might be a simple Drupal workflow, it might be something more complex. So the outcomes of the audit include alignment. Not just alignment of our content to our audience, but alignment of everyone on the team thinking strategically about the content and having a common understanding. <coughs> understanding what our calls to action are and where they belong. And this is really the start. You should not have an architecture, if you're doing a new site, an architecture, page layouts, you shouldn't have those things yet. Those should come out of the audit. Okay. Findability of the content is another outcome. So improved navigation, improved site structure. You know, the content is going to guide the architecture. The architecture doesn't guide the content. I know we have all received RFPs that have a site map in them. This is what we want, and here are the categories, and here are the subpages, and oh geez, maybe there's even a third or fourth level in those things. Okay? Take those with a grain of salt, say thank you, and build a proper architecture for the site. <laughs> and the adi an additional outcome is ownership. Now if we have a small team, this is a tough one. You know, how do we get people to, to own the content? But how do we get people to do any sort of job in the office, right? If it's my job to, you know, do the project management, I'm going to do the project management. Somebody has to be assigned to do the content. It's, it's not like catch as catch can, which happens so often. So by developing this trust amongst the team that there is an owner and there is a process we're going to create more sustainable content out of that. And the really nice thing is that it's also then going to create trust and loyalty with your audience and trust and loyalty within the team as well. Um, that is going to lead us to just greater ROI for the website as a whole. And cost control is a given. You know, We want to make sure that we're measuring what we're doing that we're integrated with the marketing strategy for the site, that we don't have to do this fairly expensive process over again that is a regular thing that's in the budget for the project, that's part of the maintenance plan of the project. So maintenance isn't just patching, 
and putting the security patches in, testing them, and going, yep, you're good to go this week until next Wednesday when we get more of these. No, we also want to be able to say maintenance is evaluating our pages on a regular basis, checking for broken links, checking for out-of-date stuff, checking that the people who are actually writing and entering the content, which may not be us, are doing it correctly and that they don't have a problem doing it. So like my client who was using that big blob body field to put all her event information in, if the person who had developed that site in the first place had seen that that's what they were doing, perhaps they would have said, you know, that we can give you some better way to do that. We can give you a way to do that so that it becomes searchable and findable and more usable. But in the meantime, all this they were doing was spending a lot of money on one person sitting down after every event. And we're not talking monthly events, we're talking daily events sitting down after every event typing all the stuff in. It's a terrible waste of money. Okay. So now we have this drawer. It's neat and it's organized and it's just the start of things. We need to be advocates for content strategy. Okay. It seems really obvious that this needs to be done but it isn't. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here because most people who are really passionate about content strategy understand the importance of it and the role of content strategy in building any web project. But it's our job to go out now and advocate. It's been way too long that we were seen as an afterthought and we need to be more proactive we have something to say. We want to learn how to use the facts that we find in our content audits to help our team understand our role, make them feel more comfortable with us being involved in every single phase of the project. From discovery through maintenance, we have a role in every aspect of the project. And so we want to make content strategy the norm in our organizations and not an afterthought. Though so I hope that some of these ideas are things you can bring back to your organizations, bring back to your teams, and find a way to not see it as a cost center, but as a way to achieve ROI on website maintenance and development. Well, that's what I've got. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, so how do you think about, in Drupal, so you've applied this on Drupal sites, right? Yes. So how do you think about uh, content types? Uh, what's your strategy with content types? Do you go with a lot of content types, or as minimal as you can get? I mean, it depends. OK. <laughs> content types. Really, I really look for commonality across pieces of content, and it's, it's a huge reason why we need to see content before we build and design. Uh, we do actually spreadsheets. I don't know, there was a session um, right before this where a gentleman presented a spreadsheet of content types, and I looked at it and I was like, I have that? Um, we, we do, we, we spreadsheet out all our content types. So if we find that the content types it, different types of content are sharing all the same fields, then we try to bring that up a level and say that those are all going to be one content type. Um, but a, you know, you often have things, events, they always need their own content type. Um, sometimes you have um, research findings that might have you know, specific categories of information that you want people to put in. And you really want to go as far away from a blob as you can, I think. You want to field your content. It's more important to field your content types as much as possible um, than an issue of how many you have. That said, I have seen projects, and, and we do mostly Drupal Rescue. So I have seen projects where people have come to us, and every section of the website is its own content type. 
So even though it should all just be basic page, basic page, basic page, it's the about content type and the who we are content type. And yeah, the people actually do do, do that. So you know, coming up with the content types really is another part of the audit. Once you've looked at all these pages, either every page or a sampling of pages, you're going to get a sense of what's the same and what's different. And so I, I like to just say that if things are the same, they don't need their own content type just because they might have a different purpose. If you think that long term something might change, oh, well, we're developing this program. And therefore, even though we're not starting the project with this data, it's going to come later. Maybe then it needs its own content type. So really, analysis is your best tool to determine what to do with that. Does that help? Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Um, trying to find the best way to, to frame it. So I you know, work, uh, work at the Y in, uh, in Nashville, and you know, lots of Wise have a person who's the who's responsible for the for managing the site, but they also have the additional like slashes in their titles. Yes. And so, how do you, when you're talking with a client who may have that small team or that person, and you know they they're going through like throwing all that stuff in the page and they're living in the world just trying to get it on. How do you manage expectations for you know what? given their capacity, would be reasonable to manage on a new site? Right, that's a really great question. Uh, and most of my clients are like that. They're very, very tiny. So I mean, I have a team right now, client that I've had for over 10 years. Um, there used to be three people on the team, one just left. There's <laughs> two people on the team, and one's the executive director. So I totally get that, where people have slashes in their titles, and they're doing 20 different things, and why is the content the thing they should do? That's where I think an editorial calendar really comes into play. Um, being reasonable about what needs to be published when. So for the why, obviously the classes need to be updated on a certain regular basis. They're the, probably the first thing that goes on the calendar. Okay, this is your priority on these days. You know, We are opening registration for September for the fall programs. We need to have these 200 classes put into the system, you know, put into the website by such and such date. So you have to set priorities. Then, okay, they understand that, and and I think they probably, you know, do that kind of work. But then, what about all this maintenance stuff? You know, how what about all this looking through the content kind of thing? Um, that's where I think you do need to sit down with that person. Mm -hmm and go, well, what does the rest of your schedule look like? Where in your schedule are you obligated to other things that you've been told you need to do? So if they're really, really busy at Christmas time, don't put any content stuff on the schedule for them then. Give them the, the latitude to go off and do their other job at that point in time. But by sitting down and going, OK, what does your schedule look like every quarter? You know, where is the room exist for doing the content work? You're just being human with them. You're just basically saying, look, this is part of your job. This does need to get done. Let's make it as easy for you as possible. Where does it fit in? And I, I think that we all suffer from having too much work. That's why, you know, I, you know, I also speak on burnout. <laughs> and, and it's, it's a huge problem right now where people are overloaded and doing multiple jobs because there's just too much to do. Uh, talking to the client, not just this person, but the clients, um, like your manager, the CEO, whoever's running the why, making them understand the ROI that comes with content strategy, sharing the data with them, you know, sit down, even if it's just a one-to-one -one and sitting down with your findings. Um, and then saying, and therefore, we really, I understand we don't have a dedicated person, but we really need to come up with a schedule that's going to be held to. And it, this is more a person management thing, I think, than a technical thing. Yeah. And, and I think in the web space, we tend to underestimate the amount of personal contact that we have to make with people. There's, 
the old adage of like doing the designs and throwing them over the wall and handing them to the developer and then going, here, your problem now. Um, so this is one case, I think, where you just have to sit down with people and, and show them the value of what they're doing and come up with a plan that works for them. Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no technical solution to this one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no. It's, yeah. We do. We need to yeah. relate more. Yeah, we're we're pretty. Yeah, our, ours is, is is pretty well resourced. But yeah, they, I was meeting with one this weekend, and that's just the the person. The slashes are usually marketing director. They're the website person, yeah. but they're also responsible for that strategy, and so they're not resourcing appropriately for that. So mm -hmm. you know. How do you get that editorial calendar to in a space where you're following those best practices as well, where it's not just, all right, here's this page in the day, but you're actually putting the URL in the calendar and yes. putting the associated tags in there so that you can at least get a hit on some SEO things, even if you can't do it. Exactly. Yeah. So what are the little things that you can do to make their life easier? Yeah. You know, the documentation, the communications, the mm -hmm. hand holding, the, you know. Also being able to say, if you have an emergency, if something comes up and you're not going to get something done, who do you go to? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because a lot of times it's just like, well, that's going to fall off my plate. Yeah. It's like, no, if it's going to fall off your plate, it's okay to say so and to create a culture where that's allowed because it's seen as just as important as keeping the site running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much.